Council Member 53, Pangea Capital Management versus Lakey <coughs> Council. <clears throat> Good afternoon. May it please the court, my name is Caitlin Bronner. I'm counsel for Pangea Capital Management, LLC. I'd like to request two minutes for rebuttal, please. Two minutes for rebuttal? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Counsel, how did the divorce judgment here create a debt? A, a, a debt, Your Honor? Yes. Well, if Your Honor is asking how it could be uh, required to have been docketed under CPLR 5203A, the answer is provided by CPLR 5203C, which requires that any that where there has been an oral or written award of an interest in real property, it must and it is it must be docketed with the clerk of the county in which such property is located not less than 30 days after the earlier real property award. And in that situation, the judgment will relate back to the date of the but earlier award. Isn't the award. question here really whether um, this is an award of real property uh, similar? Uh, uh, like all others. In other words, I, I think the argument is is that this real property always, that, 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 that the wife always had an inchoate interest in this real property. There, there was not a transfer of property. It was a division of property. It was a division, it was an equitable distribution of all of the party's marital property. And in that equitable distribution division, the wife got certain things and the husband got other things, but it wasn't a, a transfer under that under the usual understanding. Your Honor, understandably, well, with respect to the interest between the wife and the husband, that may be so, but that doesn't address the interests of third parties. Um, it's plain, and the New York legislature has, has plainly spoken on this issue. Musso versus Ostashko was a Second Circuit decision in which the rights of a former spouse arising under an equitable- But, but in Musso, there, was, there wasn't even a judgment of divorce. And, and I, think it, I, I think it's pretty clear from the Second Circuit opinion there that that was a problem. There was no judgment and there was no judgment entered, let alone docketed. And, and maybe there was maybe, you know, I think it can be viewed as everything talking about docketing was really dicta um, under the circumstances of that case. There was nothing there. Well, to, go ahead. Sorry, Your Honor. I, I, I would say that to the extent that Your Honor may believe that, CPLR 5203 answers the question. Because again, it's specifically- but Isn't 5203 just a response to Musso? I mean, it's the legislature's response to the circuit. It, it is a response to Musso, but in responding to Musso- And there's it, a it couple of problems with that. One, I think Judge Stein just mentioned it's dicta in Musso. Two, it's a circuit decision, so- We're not In terms bound. of New York law, we're not bound by it, even if it wasn't dicta. And it talks about bankruptcy. So what would that, re what relevance would that really have to well, have does, to our decision? Does CPLR 5203C have as it relates to Musso? Well, again- No, no, it I clearly addresses the Musso problem in a bankruptcy context. And if that's the rule in New York, then it would address that, but that's not what we have here. But the legislative history makes plain that it is not, that the docketing requirement is not limited to the, to the bankruptcy context. Specifically- well, But the statutory language talks, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm over here. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you started out earlier by saying 5203C requires, if, if we thought this was a judgment, that it be uh, docketed. I think you said that. I, I did, Your Honor. Where, why does it, I don't see that it requires that. I, I see that it says if you do that, then you get a certain priority in a bankruptcy. Well, it, but, it, it, well, again, if one were to look at the legislative history, it's- well, I'm asking about the words of the statute. Well, the wording of the statute specifically does speak of priority, but it says that in order to have that priority, you must dock it. So that suggests implicitly that the docketing requirement of CPLR- And that, and that priority is in a bankruptcy. Right. It's not limited to bankruptcy. It Again, not? if I may just quickly get to the legislative history. Well, let's look at this statute first. It says that created upon simultaneous later filing of a petition in bankruptcy pursuant to the U.S. Bankruptcy Code. So how is it not limited to bankruptcy? Because again, it's plain from the legislative history that it is not. So we would look at the legislative history over the plain text of the statute. This court has specifically held that it is appropriate to examine the legislative history even where the language of the statute is clear. But we generally do that to, 
to reinforce our interpretation of the statute. So what you would be asking us to do is to say the plain language of the statute is X, but the legislative history is Y, and Y is going to trump the plain language of the statute? I, I wouldn't be asking that, Your Honor. Again, CPLR 5203A makes clear that docketing is required. CPLR 5203C confirms that docketing is required, and it notes this in a specific bankruptcy context, but it is consistent with CPLR 5203A in that regard, so it is appropriate to consider the legislative so history. So if it, if it applies everywhere, why would they include the language of bankruptcy? What's I, I, the point of that? I, What's I, the point of that, if, if you're correct? that it applies regardless of whether or not it's a bankruptcy proceeding. Well, again, because it is a response specifically to Musso. Yeah, but but the, the, your, I thought your argument was it's not limited to bankruptcy, so then there would be no point to include it because, of course, it would subsume bankruptcy proceedings okay. and, and, therefore, respond to Musso. Once again, just to be clear, CPLR 5203C alters the traditional priorities that would ordinarily exist when a bankruptcy petition is filed. Yes, so no doubt. That wasn't my question, though. Okay, but again, so, so, so to the extent that it does that, it doesn't alter the, the docketing requirement that already exists in this context under CPLR 5203A. If I may, just quickly get to the legislative well, but history. Let, let's uh, go back to A, all right, and the language of A, and, and it's talking about judgment debtors. I have a much more fundamental problem, which is I don't understand how you are saying that the wife here is a judgment debtor. Well, once again, uh, I believe that that is made plain um, because in, in, in Musa, well, if, if I may, in Musa. There's no money judgment entered against the husband uh, at this point. That there's no point, money judgment uh, during these proceedings. No, there's no money judgment again, but against. So, the so how is uh, again? Uh, how is she a judgment debtor uh, or creditor uh, or you know the, uh, whether it's a creditor or a debtor, uh, a debt? Excuse me, a judgment debtor or a judgment creditor. How is she either of those things? Well, she is treated as someone who has a type of judgment which must be docketed under the statute, and again, that well, is. What, what's to follow up on Judge Feynman's argument, the purpose of docketing, as I understand your argument, is so that third parties would be on notice, right? That's correct. And of course, right. to establish priority under lien. But <clears throat> one of the problems here, and, and really neither party seems to mention this statute, but when I look at the question of how would the judge, judgment creditors be informed of a change in title when a divorce is entered in one county and the property is located in another county like we have here? The answer seems to be in the domestic relations law in section 234, not 236. And in 234, the judgment, where a judgment is recorded in the county where the property is located, in the same manner as you record a deed, and um, uh, uh, I think it sets forth, um, if you look at it, it's a, it sets forth the process to make sure that uh, those deed protections that you get in a conveyance of a deed protect notice for the other party. And um, so in, in other words, I think the law has provided to address the policy question that underlies your concern. I think that 234 and a, a recording of the uh, um, judgment in the same as an attachment to the deed uh, takes care of that underlying problem and really undermines your argument. Now, in fairness to you, 234 wasn't in your brief. So, um, uh, so I, I don't expect a great off-the-cuff answer that that wouldn't be fair to either party, but I would encourage you to look at it. All right. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Um, so, uh, under, I want to address some other aspects of the DRL too, and that is that it seems to me that there is a way that potentially a spouse could end up being a judgment creditor subject to 5203. A. And that is, for example, if the spouse gets an award of child support or maintenance or some other thing, and the other spouse, and a judgment of divorce is entered, and the other spouse doesn't pay that, the recipient spouse can then go to court and get a money judgment as a judgment creditor. And then, in order to establish priority of that judgment, would have to comply with 5203A. But if, 
if that's the case, then why would we need, for example, Section 244 of the Domestic Relations Law, which is what entitles the spouse to get a money judgment? Well, I, I think that in point of fact, the, the point Your Honor is making is, is the point that uh, Andrea Lakian's attorney has made, which is uh, that, that DRL 244 judgments uh, theoretically might need to be docketed, but not DRL 236 uh, judgments. I, I see my time is up. If I you may, may just continue. Respond, thank you. Um, but the problem uh, and the reason that, that we believe that CPLR 5203C does in fact confirm that docketing is required here is that MUSO was a DRL 236 case. It was not a DRL 244 case. And in response to MUSO, the legislature clearly and plainly made manifest its intent that, that in a MUSO type case, the judgment, not the award, but the judgment of divorce, which is the DRL 236 judgment, would have to be docketed right. and to create it, Well, priority. and in Musso, the, there was no judgment. And, and that's, that's where the, the requirement of docketing becomes, I think, uh, dicta. But, uh, but, uh, okay. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Counsel? May it please the court, uh, Judith Richmond for respondent Andrea Lakey, and good afternoon, Your Honors. Um, and we are here today, I believe, to confirm um, that equitable distribution is unlike all other aspects of the law. It is brilliant, and it provides that when a court determines that there is marital property, and they go through the factors, and they distribute the property. Counselor, the way, the way I see this is that um, at, at bottom, okay, a judgment creditor can only reach the judgment debtor's, debtor's mm -hmm. assets, correct? I, I agree. Okay. So the way that I see this is that the, the judgment of divorce, once it was entered, made these proceeds no longer the husband's assets. And so it's really not, it, whatever you want to call it, judgment debtor, or judgment creditor, or equitable distribution, it, it really comes down to that very basic rule that because of equitable distribution, that no longer belongs to him. I agree. I agree 100%. It, it, is not, it has nothing to do with being a judgment creditor and judgment debtor. She is the owner of the property as of the entry of the judgment of divorce, he is the owner of his property as of the judgment of divorce, and his creditors, Pangea or others, have a right to go against his property, not her property. She owns her property. She's not a judgment debtor of the husband, nor is he a judgment debtor of the wife. But there that could is the be family. circumstances, and I, I referred to, I alluded to them earlier, if she had, there was something else in the judgment that directed him to pay her something or whatever, um, and then she uh, received, she, she went to enforce that right and went to a court and got a judgment that would put her in a different light, correct? I, I agree. If he had owed her or a spouse owes another spouse, uh, let's say, interim support, and they don't pay the support, um, that is not equitable distribution. That is a payment of a debt, and therefore you get a judgment. Uh, that is far different than being an owner under equitable distribution, under property that's distributed. Or, or, or a distributive award. If, if, he, if he had a business and they evaluated the business and said she was entitled to some dollar amount as her interest in that business and he didn't pay her that distributive award, then she could get a money judgment, correct? Well, it was, her, it, it was her ownership interest under the distributive award and then how she proceeds to obtain that ownership interest, uh, you know, uh, there are numerous ways. Um, well, this case about real property. Uh, this case about real property. And I understood your argument to be that upon the entry of the judgment of divorce, that is a judicial determination and pronouncement of title. Correct. And also, Your Honor, in this situation, um, she was the beneficial owner of a trust. She had an, in, an increased interest in the division of the trust assets of the, uh, when it was sold. Um, so it is not necessarily real property. Um, mm -hmm. so, so, I'm sorry. So it's title ownership in the what? Well, she has, uh, she has a greater interest 
in 62.5% of the proceeds of sale plus $75,000. That's her money. And she, pri prior to the, the divorce, uh, she also had her independent interest. And then after the divorce, that is her property. So then to clarify, so you're not saying it's the title in the property Change gets sold. It's the interest in the proceeds from the sale. She had an interest in the proceeds from the sale. She also had an interest in, in, in the property. But in this case, interest in, this, in the property, a title ownership? Well, they, the, Gems 2 okay. had the title, and she had an interest, she had beneficial interest in that. Um, and that so was So this increased. divorce judgment contemplates the sale of that property and the future distribution of the proceeds based on their ownership interest as, uh, yes, as they, held by the court, right? Uh, yes, the, the uh, property was already on the market mm -hmm. at the time yes. um, of the uh, agreement and then uh, the mm -hmm. judgment of divorce. It was, and there were provisions of how they each had a right in the property and the distribution of the assets uh, upon the sale. But is the interest in the property an owner's interest? That's what I'm trying to clarify from well, your she had argument. A, she was an owner. Okay. Uh, she owned both the property. She owned the proceeds of sale uh, upon the sale. She had an interest in uh, as a beneficial owner of the trust. So under any circumstances, uh, she was an owner. Uh, and under all circumstances, she was an owner. Uh, it seems to me, counsel, that trust kind of clutters the issues here factually, right? But for us, in the certified question, they've asked us if an entered divorce judgment grants a spouse an interest in real property. So we are assuming in that question this is an interest in real property, right? And I think there are different cases, and I think they're cited in the briefs, that say a distribution whether it's sales proceeds or dividing the property, is an interest in the property, right? So the trust yes. kind of adds an interesting layer to the facts of this case, but it seems as I read this question, what the circuit is asking here is, when you grant an interest in real property, um, then what happens here? And you don't docket it, what's the effect, right? Well, they are, but in this, in this situation, one of the, uh, you know, uh, in this situation with Andrea Lakian, um, she had an interest in, um, in the trust proceeds. And uh, the answer, though, with respect to any property under equitable distribution, they don't make a distinction. That is one of the basic foundations of 236B. Is there the, is, is not the, a. Is the, sorry to interrupt you. Is the, is the import of your argument that the docketing priority doesn't matter here? Because once the judgment of divorce was entered, the, the property was separated. And at that point, even if Pangea had a priority, all it can levy against is Mr. Lakian's share. Is that Cor what you're saying? Correct. The, she was an owner. She wasn't a judgment creditor, so she doesn't dock it. But even if she were, even if we were giving a priority to uh, Pangea, it's only against, once the divorce judgment has happened, it's only against Mr. Lakian's share. Is that what Correct. you're saying? Correct. Okay. Correct. She so owned the docketing her priority share. in some ways doesn't matter. She owned her share. He owned his share. Pangea has a right against his share. They were judgment creditors post-divorce against his share, um, which is uh, the, the, the foundation of, of equitable distribution. So, uh, that once so let, let's, let's say we disagreed with you. What would the public Please. policy implications be for divorced individuals who apparently in New York have not been docketing their judgments? Um, a horror, Your Honor. Describe, it, how, how, how do you mean that? Uh, it would potentially undo thousands of awards mm -hmm. because 236, natural distribution, says you're an owner. That's how the courts have interpreted it for 40 years. If now all of a sudden the court were to say, by the way, you're not really an owner, you're a judgment creditor, and somebody has come in over the last 10 years or so. And has uh, priority. As, right, who, right who, who has a judgment against your ex-spouse, but you have the property and you've owned the property, they could come back after all those years. It also undoes all the future 
uh, of equitable distribution because 236 says it doesn't matter how title is held, then you would be saying, well, yes, if it's, if it's personality, you're the owner. At the judgment of divorce, you're the owner. But if it's real property, you're not really an owner, you're a creditor, which is not what 236 says. So you would be undoing the entire concept of equitable distribution. We would be going back to a title state mm -hmm. so, uh, and uh, make. OK, I, I think we have, I, I want to ask you about something that is not this case. And I recognize it's not this case, but I'm, I'm a, a little worried about it. Um, and that is uh, part of your argument is uh, built upon the entry, right, and the timely entry here of the divorce judgment. But what happens, uh, and I see this as you know maybe a, a future case, when uh, there's a divorce, uh, you know, and, and the judge comes down with a decision uh, after trial and divides up the uh, property under equitable distribution and directs entry uh, of, of the judgment, um, and there's a delay in the county clerk's office for weeks and weeks and weeks, and uh, it may even go beyond 30 days for bankruptcy uh, under the state. You know, then what are we going to do? Well, I, I think that the courts have already basically determined um, that uh, yes, you know, and, and, and assuming and that you know Pangea or whoever uh, the creditor is has, uh, in the meantime, uh, you know, docketed. Uh, well, they have. Right. I mean, in. in um, I, I guess what I'm getting at is is the focus uh, on entry. That is what the courts have said that there's an inchoate right, that you have a protectable right during a divorce, but when the judgment of divorce is entered, you are an owner. Your ownership vests, and that is it. So if the county and, clerk but, delays in entering, uh, the, the, that spouse is unprotected? Well, you have, I mean, there, there are potentially, I mean, ways of, I, I assume, of, of getting potential, there are restraints in uh, you know, in, in, in the matrimonial law and in the equity distribution law, um, I, certainly that uh, 5203C was enacted for one specific purpose, and that was uh, where um, the judgment, of, where the divorce had been on the record and it hadn't yet been entered. Right. And so the court said both in commercial cases and in <laughs> matrimonial cases, and I believe docketing had to do with commercial cases, not with matrimonial cases, but uh, you could then be considered, uh, you get an extra 30 days. Um, does the legislature then- So we'll have to cross that path uh, with the legislature it, down the road. That is advised down the road, but, but for this case and for all other thousands of cases and all other thousands of litigants, um, the entry of the judgment confers vested, absolute, complete ownership. You go, one you know, spouse, ex-spouse goes their way, another ex-spouse goes their way. That is what is frankly partly so brilliant about it. You do not, you, you are not a judgment creditor in those situations, and you have the ability to get on with your life economically in other ways. And that is what happened in this case. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Your Honor. Council, what about respondents' projection that if we were to decide in your favor, this would be a horror? <laughs> uh, that's simply not so, Your Honor. Uh, Why the short is that? answer is that uh, this is, this. The decision in this case will apply to a very narrow class of cases, um, cases in which the property at issue is held in a trust, uh, in which the divorce judgment doesn't require the property to be deeded uh, outright uh, and the trust dissolved. So and you're saying if, the, if, if this property was in the husband's name, but same, same terms of this, the judgment of divorce, that would be a different result? 
Well, I, I'm simply saying that, again, the, the, the unique facts of this case uh, are that the property is held in a trust. Um, see, I don't, I'm, what I'm trying to get is I don't see why the trust makes any difference here. Well, also, the property is located in a different uh, county. Uh, and, and again, as is that that's so um, unusual? I mean, the parties may have been separated for a long time. One lives in one county, another lives in another county. Someone may live in another state. Uh, and, and is further evidenced by the fact that the Second Circuit certified this question because uh, there were simply no decisions of this court. In fact, there are only two trial court decisions <coughs> that have addressed the, the intersection of, of the areas of law that, that are manifest in this, in this, uh, on, on this appeal. Um, if, if I may that just, may be because nobody raised it before. But. Uh, if I may just quickly uh, respond to, to two other points. First of all, uh, with respect to the focus on, on entry as opposed to uh, docketing, I would note that the legislature has made plain that, quote, under CPLR 5203A, the Supreme Court's award of the marital home could not be enforced until docketed. That is referring to the Musso decision. So clearly it was the moment of docketing in Musso, not entry, which would have, confer, could, would have conferred upon uh, Tanya Oshtashko her, her rights. Um, additionally, I just wanted to note again the legislature does not distinguish, um, uh, well, it specifically provides that in both matrimonial and commercial actions, docketing affects legal ownership and the docketing date determines the seniority of competing property interests. See CPLR 5203A. That is in the legislative history of CPLR 5203C. It plainly, it plainly indicates that in both matrimonial and commercial cases, docketing that clearly comes seniority. from the language in Musso, right? I mean, uh, it, excuse me, Your we Honor? can assume that that language <coughs> comes from the, that, that that comes from the language in Musso. Right? Uh, it, it is the legislative response to Musso, Your Honor, specifically, um, uh, not not from the language itself in Musso, and that confirms, in my respectful opinion, uh, or it, 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 it confirms that it, we believe that clearly the legislature was making plain in response to Musso that in all matrimonial cases, whether DRL 236 or DRL 244, <coughs> docketing is required in order to confer, uh, uh, in, in order to determine seniority, um, including in, in, in matrimonial cases. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you, Your Honor.